So 2023 was really your year. I fought once. I feel like it's hard. I mean, it was a big fight, but it was only one time. So it feels like I could have done more, but, you know, hard to top what I did do. Right. You became the world champion. I mean, for you, what's the level of activity that's preferred in the fight game? Uh, title fights definitely change it. I mean, just the training camp alone is, you know, a lot. But uh, I'd say minimum two, two fights a year. Um I remember, like, as an amateur, we'd fight five, six, seven times a year. Obviously, the higher level competition, you know, when you're champ, you can, you know, in the bantamweight division, there's actually a lot of people that are, like, waiting to fight. So it's different than some divisions where it's like, who's the next guy? We don't really know. Right. The bantamweight division, there's really not a shortage of who's next. So, you know, I'd like to, two, two, two three times a year would be, would be nice, but it's, it's hard to, uh, Hard to guess. Take it one at a time. Yeah. Well, that's the future. Let's talk about the past. Mm -hmm. When you look at the road that it took to get that title around your waist, I mean, what really comes to mind when you explore the journey? Um, it was, uh, I think the UFC did a good job with, you know, placing me in certain fights and stuff, but it was a lot of knockouts. I love looking back on the highlight reel. Um, that never gets old, so... You know, I like the narrative was like I never fight the toughest guys, and then you know, 2022. Well, you know, I fought Peter Yan, who was ranked number one. Mm -hmm. Next fight, I fight the greatest bantamweight of all time, Aljo. So my last two fights kind of take that narrative away, because um, I was never turning fights down. I was just accepting the fights they offered me. So uh, you know, it was it, it's it's worked out perfect. For the Aljamain fight, you know, you kept this secret kind of really close to the best that. In some ways, you were physically compromised. Yeah. Why? Why still go ahead with the fight then? This is, you know, this could be a life-changing opportunity. If it doesn't go your way, it might be a really long time till you can get back in line. Main event, Boston. I had to show up. Um, you know, if it would have been, I, I tried to grapple a little bit, and it just there was, I was not able to grapple at all. Obviously, I've, I've said that plenty of times, but uh, you know, I was able to kickbox, and my whole goal going into the fight before I was injured was do not let him take me down. That was the whole game plan. I was, to, you know, it wasn't shying away from that. I'm not, I don't want him to take me down. So after I had the rib injury, it was just like, that was the game plan. Just, a hat. I literally could not let him take me down. Two, he, he had two attempts, you know, failed on both. So I just looked at it as like, if I just keep it where I need to keep it on the feet, I know I can knock him out. And I went in there with that confidence that, you know, I'm going to do, I know what I'm capable of doing and uh got the job done you know you're really realistic when you speak to us about fights and you're very aware of all the threats and dangers that are presented by your opponent when you got into the octagon that night in boston i mean what was your vision of what might happen uh i was gonna knock him out i, I seen it like i knew i was capable of it and i just you know i just I, it still seems like a dream it still seems like that really happened like that perfect it really and it did i haven't woke up from a dream um, I knew I was capable of that. I just literally was 100% self-belief in myself that I could go out there and put his lights out. Um, I just had to fight very smart. And even watching that second round back, I made a mistake. I threw a teep kick and, you know, kind of came off my back foot, fell, gave him an opportunity to put me up against the cage where he wanted me, where he got me at the end of the first round. He didn't do anything with it, didn't have enough time. I, you know, I had good defense up against the cage. And then going in that second round early on in the in the round, so that was a huge mistake. That I still it still bugs me that that happened. Knowing what happened after, you know, it makes me feel a little bit better. But the fact that I, my whole thing was like I cannot make a mistake against this guy. I cannot make a mistake, and to make a stupid little mistake like that, to uh, throw a throw a body kick, fall on the ground, him push me up against the cage. Um, but I've been working a lot. I've been working on the def res defensive wrestling for you know that's been everyone's plan. My entire career was take me down. So it's like. I wasn't able to train those last six weeks, but I was able to train, you know, those last 10 years. When you relive that night in your mind, can you, like, think about that moment where the belt is wrapped around your waist? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's weird. Like, that moment, so, like, random vivid moments. I remember, like, a vivid moment, the crowd yelling, F you, Aljo. Like, I remember that being very vivid. Um, you know, I, it's hard for me to remember moments in the and I feel like I'm just like living in a different world in there but yeah I kind of I remember like taking the pictures with the family after Dana wrapping the belt around me you know talking to Rogan but the fight itself I don't feel like I remember too much of 
right after a little bit bits and pieces but it's like it's hard to remember stuff like that yeah and so much adrenaline going through yeah, your system yeah. as well um you know after the fight john you had this big entourage and i'm sure that you guys had a lot of fun and you did some celebrating so i'm curious like what were those moments like compared to when you had your first moment of real calm and peace after becoming the world champion that well that fight got over so late I technically fought sunday morning so all day saturday just kind of sat around fought sunday didn't get to the hotel till like 3 4 a.m so Usually after the fights, I've partied with the boys and went out and got, you know, a little buzzed up, <laughs> sucked on some happy dads. But, uh, whoa, that just, you know, drank some happy dads. I got to rephrase that one. That one, uh, go viral with yeah, that one. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, so I didn't drink after. We just kind of went up to the hotel, ate some pizza, hung out. Um, so it was actually kind of peaceful right after the fight, really. Like, we didn't, we went up to the hotel, the team was there, and, uh, it was actually, you know, very chill, other than surfing on Twitter and, and Instagram for about six hours, LOLing at people and had a good time with that because there was a lot of people, I have no shot, there's zero chance, there's no way. And uh, so I got to get some good giggles in with that. But yeah, after the fight, you know, I didn't, we didn't, we had a little party the next weekend, took the boys out. But uh, yeah, so it was, it was actually you know, pretty peaceful on, uh, you know, flight home, had a jet, of course. Well, I got, so as I one flew does. Home. Uh, from Boston, and uh, there was a little peaceful on that too. Yeah. What were what were your thoughts to yourself when you're in those quiet moments? Like y you obviously had all the confidence in the world that you would accomplish this mm -hmm. goal, but it still had to be some really nice self talk after being able to do that. Yeah, I just feel like that was just like the beginning. So I started, it is cool. It, ha it ha you never can take that away from me. I I've been world champ. That's you know was the dream once I started like 17, 18, when I wanted to be in the UFC, when I wanted to be world champ. So that's cool, but I still feel like I have so much to do. Um, and I knew Cheeto won that night, so I knew like that was gonna happen next. I didn't know when. I was calling for December. You know, UFC already had plans for December, already had plans for this, plans for that. So, you know, it ends up being in March. So I was kind of waiting around for that. But yeah, I feel like it's just time to get back to work. So you brought up Cheeto, let's talk about Cheeto. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the timeline because I think some people were surprised to see that they had to wait until March to see you compete again, but that wasn't necessarily the timeline of your choice. Yeah, I mean, it works out better for me. Not like looking back, I, I just like competing. I like performing. I want to, you know, do it more. Um, but I think March works out the best. I think it's you know about four months away, so that, that, that works out perfect for. I like twelve weeks. I like a good three months of camp, um, so that's gonna work out nicely. But, uh, yeah. What do you think when you look back upon that first fight with Cheeto? I mean, how how do you assess the whole thing? What are your honest opinions? I was whooping his ass. He got lucky. That's that's how I've felt ever since that fight happened. And I do believe, truly, he will never admit it, but he knows how lucky he got that night. Um, but it worked out good. You know, here we are. I'm defending. You know, I get pay-per-view points. It's, you know, it's, there's a story behind it. It makes it that much bigger. It's bigger than anybody else in the division. So... The fact that that happened August 20th, August 2020, and then I win the belt August 2023, you know, it was pretty, it was three years later. And, uh, you know, the, so the fight, it, it just, it, it ob it's the one that ha makes the most sense. Um, yeah, and I, I'm very excited. I've never been this excited for a fight. Really? Uh, well, I mean, each fight I probably will say that, but yeah, there's something extra on this one. And, you know, they, they talk about championship fights and they say, like, yes, you get the belt, but you really prove you're a champion with your first title defense. Are yeah. you a subscriber to that thought? I agree with that. I feel like, uh, I mean, I definitely feel like the champ, but it's there's something, you know, you got to defend it. I feel like going out there defending it and, uh, you know, feel a little bit more like the champ. So, yeah, I agree with that. What does Cheeto from 2020 compared to Cheeto from 2023 like what do those differences look like in your mind as an opponent um I think you know everyone in the UFC is always improving you know you book fights you go through training camps you get better each fight um I haven't watched the Pedro Munoz fight against Cheeto to be honest um so I haven't I haven't watched that I watched his fight against Frankie Edgar that I thought he lost until he you know, knocked him out, which he knocked him out fair, but I thought he lose most of that fight. Um, I thought he looked really good against Rob Font. Uh, I thought he looked decent against Jose Aldo. So, you know, he's ma making improvements. He's fought some good guys. Uh, I just feel like I was better then and I'm, you know, better now. So I feel like I'm going to go out there and get the job done. 
do you feel like you've had a substantial growth in those three years? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel like I've, yeah, a ton. I think I fought, you know, I fought three times in 2020. 2021, I think I fought twice. 2020, I think, I, or 2022, I think I fought twice. So I fought a good amount of time since that fight. I think we both have actually we both fought quite a bit since that fight. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. You know, at 135, you, you mentioned it when we started this conversation, there's so much talent and there's so many people yeah. waiting for fights. How how did Cheeto become the guy that was going to get the opportunity? Because you have a whole line. Oh, it's money? Money, 100%. And it's not even just my call. If I could, if it was my call, it would be Cheeto, but it's not my call. It's the UFC's call. And the UFC picked Cheeto because me versus Cheeto is a bigger fight than me versus Murab, me versus Corey. You know, those are big fights because I'm involved, but me versus Cheeto, like I said, three years before I won the belt, that happened, and uh, it's. I think it's twice as big of a fight as me versus the other people. Yeah. Are you at all looking forward to closing the Cheeto chapter after the fight? Because since, really, the lead up to your original fight, there's been so much talk about the two of you, and then the way that fight ended, yeah. the talk continued, and it's just been like several years now of being like, are they going to fight again? When should they fight again? Is there any part of you that's like, I just want this part over and done with? No, I mean, I don't really feel like that. Because I, I never, I could have got that rematch right away. But I said, I'm going to get that rematch when I want it. When the time's right, I'm going to call for that rematch and I'll get it. I could have got it whenever. I just waited until the time was right. But I've never lost sleep over it. I truly don't feel like I lost man-to-man, skill for skill. I don't feel like he beat me. So I don't feel like uh, I need to get that one back. This is purely a money fight. Like, I'm going to make way more money fighting him. I get pay-per-view this fight than I would fight any of these other guys. So this is a money fight for me. I don't really feel like I have to get this back. Talking about money and money fights, I mean, how has life changed for you since becoming the champion, both personally and then professionally? Um, I don't really feel like they changed too much either. I think a lot of people before they're champs are, you know, maybe making a few hundred thousand dollars here and there. I was a multimillionaire before I was champion. I don't think a lot of people so, so when I go out there and win the belt and I'm champ now, it's like I'm still, you know, making a lot of money, love money, but I don't feel like I went from not rich to rich, where I feel like some champs, that's how it goes. Like, I'm not rich, now I'm rich. I've been rich for a while. So that didn't really change me, and I feel like, I felt like I was champ before this champ too. I was the biggest name in the division for a long time. And uh, so, yeah, I just, I mean, I always had a target on my back. Usually the champ's like, all right, I want to, you know, I want to beat this guy. I've had a target on my back since, you know, the Contender Series, since Snoop Dogg was going crazy. I've kind of always had that target. So, you know, I felt like champ for a while. Um, life does not really feel much different, to be honest. I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe defend the belt a few more times. Maybe it will. But I think it's a good thing. I still feel like the same. Sure. How did your daughter react? Does she understand? No, she doesn't understand yet. She doesn't. Like, sometimes I'll watch the fight on, you know, YouTube or ESPN, mm -hmm. and uh, that's daddy. Like, she'll, she'll picture me, point me out while I'm fighting, but uh, she, I don't think she has any idea. She just turned three a few days ago, so she's still a little bit too young to really understand. She loves going to jiu-jitsu, though. She just runs around. She doesn't really do anything yet, but she likes to say, I'm going to go to jiu-jitsu and run around. So that's good. Yeah, that's yeah, great. That's Speaking of the gym, I mean... Does anything change for you now that you are champion in terms of your training? Is it exactly the same? And how quickly did you get back in the gym? Because I know you're, you're constantly training. Um, I am building right now. I just got the concrete laid while I was gone, getting a nice warehouse on my property, going to put a full-size octagon in there. Because, you know, every gym I've trained at and every gym I've ever really been to, they've always had the small, the apex mm -hmm. cage. And I hate that cage. It's too small. I just do not like it. So I'm getting a, you know, a full-size octagon in my warehouse that's being done right now. It should be done for camp. So I'd like, I'll probably start sparring in there. But as far as just like training day to day, jiu jitsu, hitting minutes, all that stuff, I don't mind going to the, you know, Tim's gym and, and doing that. That feels good. But sparring and, and I'll probably have some more personal sessions at my house. But yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Tim. What was it like for you? We talked so much about it before the fight to actually hand that belt to him and, <laughs> and have that moment together. Yeah, it was cool. I think we were both kind of in the same mindset. Like, it was really cool while it was happening, but we were both like, all right, we got to get back to work. Like, cause there's still a lot to do. He's open. You know, he has a ton of students. He opened, He has his own gym in, in Peoria, and uh, so he's, you know, right back to work. He's, he, he owns the gym. He's got to make sure everything's running smoothly. So it was really cool in the moment. Um, it was cool a few weekends, like you go out to the club and you know, your song, it's like, it feels good, but now it's like, okay, it's been a couple months, it's, we're over it. We're, we're ready to get back to work. 
Um, the face off of Cheeto yesterday made it feel so real. It, it felt like uh, just felt good. Made you, I wanted to get really back to work anyway, but now that I have this like more official, it feels feels good, ready to go. You know, I, you guys are such students of the game, both you and Tim. And I'm curious if you've heard this mantra by Teddy Atlas, our good friend and obviously a legend of the boxing game, where he said the champion gets better by about 30% by just having the belt. <laughs> Do you believe that? Do you believe something about your aura or your skill is elevated by accomplishing this goal? Um, I get that. I feel like I feel like I felt that when I knocked out Alfred. When I knocked out on the Contender Series, I feel like I took that 30%. Like, just going back to the gym, I'm like, oh, wow, I can do that. Um, and then knock, or, uh, beating Peter was, a, was another one where I was like, okay, I always knew I could compete, but this was the first time I fought. I fought Peter Jan, who in my eyes is still one of the best in the division. And I went out there, and it was a very close fight, um, but I got the job done. And then knocking out Aljo, yeah. So I, I, mean, I feel like uh, for the most part I would agree with that, but um, I did gain a lot of confidence knowing Aljo in my eyes was the hardest fight in the division. The best grappler, one of the best wrestlers. He's really well at putting it together, defended the belt more than anyone. Um, he was just a very, very dangerous opponent. So to go out there, stuff both of his takedowns, and then get him out of there in seven minutes, we fought and, and, and take him out, um, definitely gained a lot of confidence, yeah. Do you think you'll ever see Aljo again? Uh, I'll probably see him at the PI because I, I mean, like, he lives there. in competition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never say never, but I, like I said, there's so many guys in and at 35, and you know his whole narrative is I'm going up to 45, these weight cuts are too hard. And I go put his lights on. He's like, well, maybe I'll stay down here at 35. Uh, so we'll see. I think, I mean, the dude says he walked around 175. That's ridiculous. I'm, I'm maxed out right now 160, probably. So to, if you're, you know, it's 15 pounds heavier than I am, I, I don't know why you wouldn't go up to 45 unless you're a little insecure about your skills and you're like, eh, maybe I should go down to 35. These guys are a little smaller. You know, I think he has the skills to fight at 145, but maybe he doesn't have it up here. In such a talent-rich division, and God, it's 135, I think, is the most stacked yeah, right now currently. Um, does it give something extra to you? Obviously, being the world champion is mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. It's the end goal for every athlete who steps in there. But is there something special knowing that you're the world champion of probably the best division in the UFC as well? Yeah, I do think that is very cool. I agree. I think the bandweight division right now is the best division in the UFC, and to be you know champ of that feels great. You know, it feels... Uh, it's exciting. You know, with with the championship world title comes a lot of responsibility yeah. that some maybe don't realize. And when athletes, some athletes get into that position, they don't love, which is the media spotlight. You are here in New York City. You're doing a ton of media obligations. I know your days are packed. And that just gets to be heavier and heavier as you continue on in the lead up to this fight. Do you like all of this and how do you embrace it and make sure that you're you're able to have the energy to do it all plus train plus prepare for a fight yeah i think i was eased into it like i feel like even when i fought you know paiva or pedro munoz or peter like i was i had my media days were championship media days i had as much media as the champs did as the main eventers did going into those fights so i feel like i'm used to it at this point um, coming to New York, you know, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to train. I'm going to do media for three, four days. It'll be good for me. Um, I'm actually leaving today. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen my princess, Atlanta, since, because I had to go to Atlanta for a few days. So I left Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Won't see her, to, you know, we get in super late Thursday. So I'm ready to get back home and see my little princess and uh, get back to work. But yeah, doing media stuff like this, it's part of the game. I've always been, I like the business aspect of it. I like the media. I love the fighting. So I, I enjoy it all to where some fighters don't. They're lost. But to your credit, it, it is an exhausting thing. thing. Yeah. It really is. And I don't think people really understand what that means to do all these media obligations yeah. plus everything else. So kudos to you for being able to do all of that. Um, I know that you are a big fan of meditation. So when you meditate upon 2024, the rematch, all of the goals that you have. I mean, how does Sugar Sean stay on the throne? Oh, uh, I yeah, I just you know I got to take a day at a time and just get through each day and uh, try to make the best out of each day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, by the end of 2024, I'd like to fight two times. You know, Cheeto, obviously March. Uh, I would love to go out there and put his lights out. You know, winning the decision is boring. It's just that doesn't sound very exciting to go out there. I mean, if it's a war, maybe. But even then, it's like put, taking someone out. 
they're done, they're finished, they couldn't continue. That's that's what I'm that's what I want. Um, and then I would like to get another one in by the end of the year and be the biggest star in sports, not just combat sports. I think I go out there and put two beautiful performances together. I will be as big as Connor. Uh, the UFC's grown 40, 50 percent since Connor has has really was in his prime. That COVID really boosted the UFC, so I have a lot more eyeballs, a lot more opportunity to become, you know, more of a star. And uh, you know, people when I say stuff like that, people are always like, "Oh, you want to be Connor?" He's the biggest star in combat sports. Of course, I would, you know, want to be as big as him. Like, when people say that, it sounds a little silly. I know I acted like I was just going to end that interview, but I, I, I mean. <laughs> When I used to speak to Connor in the lead up to when he was a more active fighter in the lead up to his fights, he would talk to me about these different goals, such as the Forbes list and, you know, all these different things. I want to be the not just the wealthiest fighter. I want to be the, the wealthiest athlete of yeah. the year. Do you have goals like that that you've set for yourself? 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Why, especially seeing like Connor do it. I, I believed in myself and knew wanted to do stuff like that before Connor kind of came on the scene and did it. But the fact that he did it, it. it it allows me to even dream bigger like oh he, he can make 100 million i want to make 200 million like i can dream bigger now because of what he's done and i you know i uh i foresee that in my future for sure um sean how would you assess yourself as a fighter back in 2020 when you first faced cheeto versus who you are now like where do you see specific growth in your own game um i was very confident going into that fight I, you know i had a really good training camp for that fight and uh, i believed it was a good matchup for me and uh, since that fight, I've been on a tear. I think I've knocked out, you know, Thomas Almeida, Moutinho, Paiva, Pedro, Peter, Aljo. Um, so I've, I've gained a lot of confidence. I've had a lot of fights and uh, I've improved a lot since that last fight. You have connected with so many people. Chins. My well, Yes, ch you have connected with so many chins, but you've connected with fans around the world. I mean, my, in my own family, as you well know, because yes. I told you about it, my nephew can't believe that I get to talk <laughs> to you. I am the coolest aunt because uh, of it. But you, in Boston, I mean, they were chanting your name from the press conference to the way ins to the fight. Everywhere you go, people know Sugar Sean. Yeah. I watched you on a morning show, yeah. and they were very familiar with you, yeah. and they're, you know... They're not necessarily the typical UFC fans. What do you attribute that to? I, I, I like to think it's, you know, comes down to the performances, the, the, the amount of knockouts, the highlight reels that I've put on. You know, you, you go knock someone out in crazy fashion. You know, that's on Instagram that gets circulating through the algorithm and then the random people start seeing it. And I've done that a lot, you know, so I think I attribute that to that. Um, I'd like to think I'm funny and good looking too, it helps, <laughs> but I attribute uh, most of it to the knockouts, just the performances and obviously the UFC's platform. You've always been yourself. Ever since we started doing interviews together, you've always been you. I mean, how, how do you claim that so confidently? Because this is a, a sport where you're really out there for all yeah. to see, you know, good and bad, but also behind the scenes, there, there's just so much and you have so much on your shoulders. How have you always just remained you? Um. Probably just the people around me, I feel like, maybe. Uh, I feel like it's easier to be yourself than to try to pretend to be something all the time. So, I, I don't know. I feel like probably just the people I'm around keep me grounded, keep me humble, and uh, yeah, I don't know, probably that. Yeah, and you have great people around you Very who great. have yeah. uh, also inspired the businessman that you are yeah. as well. How would you describe yourself in the world of business and what really does it look like? What, what lights your fire in that world? I was always motivated by money since uh, since I was a little kid. I remember, you know, at 16, 17 years old, you get, you know, $5 a ticket you sell. And I was selling merch. So I was, you know, at 16, 17 years old, I was hustling, trying to sell tickets, trying to sell, you know, the shittiest merch ever. Um, and I think that's where it kind of started from. You know, I'd go out there and I could make a couple thousand bucks as an amateur fighting. And that was, you know, I was making more than beginning pros. And I think a lot of that was, you know, in Montana, they had a lot of support for me and we fought a lot. So I think that was it. But yeah, I've always been motivated by money, interested in money. And, you know, having money gives you freedom. And I've always wanted freedom. And, you know, it's just put those together. And that's what I've just, con I don't know why. I've always, I think it's probably because when I was little, my mom was very, you know, stingy. She wanted to make, but she had four kids and she wanted to make sure we all had everything we needed. So it was always, everything was about money. We go out about money. And uh, I think that was embedded in me when I was a little dude. And I was like, I never want to have to be like that. And it wasn't in a bad way. I just was, uh, yeah, motivated by money.
What's it feel like to be able to give your daughter literally anything? Oh, my little princess, it's dangerous. You gotta be careful. I don't want her being too, uh, too princessy. So it is tricky, you know, she wants a popsicle in the morning. You gotta tell her no, and Elena, it's 8 a.m. You can't have a watermelon popsicle. So it's tricky, but uh, she definitely, we go to the store, she grabs something, it's like, all right, I guess, I guess she gets that today. But yeah, no, it's, it's uh, trying to find a balance. I don't want her to be too spoiled. Um, but yeah, she's definitely spoiled. Is there a dream business endeavor for you? I would like to, I mean, I have a lot of brand deals right now that I'm, you know, a part of. I would like to have my own brand, my own, you know, I don't want to force anything though. So, so we, we're, we've definitely been thinking about what, what the Sugar Show, what the Sugar brand could uh, come up with and be in my own brand and, and uh, do stuff like that. We don't really have anything specific right now, but we have a bunch of ideas and I have good people around me, Emron, who's, you know, the CEO of Sanibel, the owner of Sanibel, he's a lifesaver for me, business genius. So, you know, we're bouncing ideas off each other all the time, constantly having phone calls. I love talking to all my brand partnerships too, like on the phone with them and, and I'm learning a lot right now. So, you know, I'd like to do some big things, just don't want to force anything. Yeah, you've always seemed to be really good at forging those relationships with brands as well. Even yeah. when uh, maybe you were just coming up in the game and there were bigger stars, you were seeming to have mm -hmm. these bigger partnerships. Yeah. Um, so certainly you're you're learning through this experience um, as well. You mentioned Connor though um, earlier, and he is supposed to return, hopefully in the next couple of months. <laughs> Um, I know that in terms of what he's accomplished has been inspirational to you, but are you looking forward to watching him fight again? Hell yeah. I'm more excited than anyone watching a Conor fight. I love watching a Conor fight. I love watching the, the inter I've watched every interview Conor's done. Same with Chael. I've watched every interview <laughs> that Chael's ever done. I've got a lot of inspiration from him too. Uh, but yeah, Conor, you know, the fight weeks, the embeds, the countdowns, the, the interviews with Megan, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Connor, and I would be, you know, very excited to watch him come back to compete. What are your What are your expectations for him in the return? You know, he's looking good. You know, he's posting little videos here and there, training. Looks like he's grappling a lot. Uh, you know, so he's he's very skilled. Um, but I think what sets people apart is is obviously the mi mindset. You know, I think if he can get get back on that, and and it is, you know, you're not going to be as good as you were if you were you know training and grinding for years and then you you know you're living on a yacht and doing these things like you just aren't going to be the same guy so i think and i yeah it's it's just about what you do in the for those three months if he's three months and dialed in focused laser focused on the task at hand you know i think he'll show up and, and put on a performance all right this is my final question i swear <laughs> i believe that there's only been like one custom pair of shorts in the organization before bryce mitchell Thank camo can we see pink shorts as the champion? I mean, I feel like you get to call some shots now. Yeah, I, I would think so too. Um, I I was just talking to Nikki about that, and she said, "Hey, you might have to ask Dana." So I might have to have a conversation with Dana to see if that uh, if that could happen. But pink shorts in uh, in Miami, maybe a little blue, maybe a little gold. I don't know. We'll see. I think there's a good shot, a good chance of that. It only feels right. It does. I mean, it really <laughs> does. Well, I'm in full support. Not that anyone cares about what I say or what my vote is, but full support. I will let Dana know that you're in support of cool. it. Good help. <laughs>